you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, the, the title of the talk is Ultramarathon Canoe Racing, but in many ways, certainly for this audience and for this location, this is a glance inside the brain of Scott Mansker, who is back there in the back, and who is the uh, person who opened up this entire can of worms for the Midwest. So I think it's really important to point that out, and I'm, you're gonna hear me refer to some of those early discussions with Scott, but that guy right back there is definitely the brainchild for this kind of uh, insane development that happened. But I think that's an important way to start out this talk too, and is also to talk a little bit about why it is that Scott was interested in doing the race, why it is he contacted me, and why I was interested in doing the race. And it had to do with a shared, um, more than just a fondness for the Missouri River, but an intense understanding of how important it was, both historically, contemporary, and spiritually, and in all sorts of ways. And yet, a vast majority of the citizens aren't really aware of this amazing river. So that was a driver for Scott, that was a driver for me in terms of some of my professional work and other things that I was doing. And so when he talked about this race, there was an instantaneous synergy and it was related to and still is about the river. And the people that do this race come away changed and, and their, position, their viewpoint on the river is permanently altered and almost always positively. Um, in fact, uh, it's even when they had a, maybe a miserable time, they come away with a, a fondness for the river. And I'll go into that a little bit later. All right, so another, another alternate title for this would be this one right here, all right? Because there's definitely no doubt about it that this is a little bit irrational to do the race. So let's talk about the history of this. And this is some of the races that Scott was aware of that kind of put this brainchild in his mind. And so let's talk about the history of these, these crazy races. You can't really talk about that history without talking about the Texas Water Safari. Now, I don't think anybody can really understand the Texas Water Safari unless you've really dug into what it means to do that race. Calling this race a race on a river is, a, is, a, is giving a, 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 quite a stretch a Texas tall tale because most of the river is actually full of logs and debris and depending on how much water they've had it can literally be nothing more than what we would think of as a creek and even when it's in high water it's not what we would traditionally think of as a river this is an extremely tough race it's uh, over 260 it's 262 miles and let me show you um, actually it's back up that map not a very large map but you see that basically runs from the heart of Texas all the way down to the Gulf and so you're going to cross a, an entire series of um, starting out with cost topography and clear water, and you're going to end up in, in, a, in a coastal uh, estuary setting. The race is full of challenges. It's not like the Missouri River, which is a fairly straightforward river to run in terms of technical obstacles. And there's a cleanup crew, quite literally, on the uh, Texas Water Safari. You go through swamps at the end where there's plenty of, of alligators. And actually, nobody's ever been hurt by an alligator in the race, but they've been hurt by um, alligator gar that have been jumped into the boat because they were panicked and have lacerated people. One of the guys, Wes Hansen, had finished the race almost completely. The winds blew him to shore. He had to be walking down the shore on the bay to get in, and he got stung by it. He got stung by a stingray. You know, after 260 miles, you get a stingray sting you. I'm sure he was just thinking, what's next? Bring on the sharks. But um, it's an intense race, has challenges, both physical and mental, that we don't face on the Missouri River races. So it has all these dams on it that you have to portage around. And so as a result of this, they build special boats just for this race. Not only are these boats ridiculously um, strong, so you can flip this boat over and walk down the back of the boat, um, but the boats are set up so that they hold all your gear so that when the boat flips, and gets and you lose control of it that all your stuff stays in it because they have to have everything on from the beginning to the end of the race the only thing they're allowed to get assistance on is water so tough race but the it develops some specialized boats just for that race which is something to talk about when it comes to the our race here because we ended up having these boats come up initially but i think we're evolving what it means to have our own specialized boat as well um, more insights on what the water safari is about this is the part that keeps me from having any interest in whatsoever in doing this race there are places down there where the log jams are so intense i mean that bottom picture is the one that really gets it for me can you imagine the upper right picture where you have to get out of your boat paddle 40 feet get out of your boat, paddle 40 feet, get out of your boat, paddle 40 feet, 
over and over again in Texas heat, exhausted, no sleep, and this is the kind of torture that this race is all about. They say this is the toughest race there is, and I, I don't doubt it. I've never done the race, um, but I, I don't take anything away from how difficult this race must be. And again, developed some very specialized boats, um, a little hard to see, but also the reason they developed specialized boats is the standard boats just weren't making it. The boats tend to get destroyed in the Texas water safari. All right, that picture is a classic. This is from the very beginning of this. The Texas Water Safari has a steep history going all the way back into the 1960s. And that picture is, has so many things about that picture that if you look at it closely. One, the exhaustion. Two, these guys are actually have rowing rigs on their canoe as an attempt to see if that would be a more efficient way to get down the river. That was abandoned. Most people conceded that that wasn't useful, but that was very early in the race as folks were trying to see who could make it down this race for the first time. The bragging rights associated with this race are intense, and they still are to this day. It's a very cutthroat race. All the correct ways to go and the sneaky little channels and all the insider information tightly guarded secrets. All right, another race, completely on the other spectrum in North America. Now we go up all the way up north, and this is Yukon River Quest. This is a 444 mile race. The unique thing about this race is it happens in the summer, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basically transitions out of Alaska into, um, in, in through the, into Canada. Um, but because it's so far north, for those of you who've been up there in the summertime, you'll, you'll remember that there's no nighttime. So this is a unique race in that it never gets dark um, during the entire race. Now they do have mandatory downtime. They make people get some sleep, but this is a pretty intense race. This is a race that is very much a wilderness race. There's nobody to rescue you. There's no even way to get to you to rescue you. So this is a race where it's quite serious. So they, they're very, they don't allow people to bring super skinny race boats to this race because of the safety factor. Um, and this is also a, a race that's on most people's bucket lists. And, and Scott was quite aware of both of these races. So there's another example of how, how intense the uh, wilderness area is and how really remote you are when you're doing this race. And that's the, one of the biggest threats when you're up there doing this race is uh, the Yukon crocodile as these mosquitoes get insane up in that region. I've never done this race, but I've been up into that Alaska region in the summertime. It is phenomenal, it's beautiful, but it's also shocking how intense the wilderness is. We are not used to thinking the way that you have to think up there. If you were to walk in the backcountry trying to get out to a road, you could literally walk for 150 miles and not bump into a road if you happen to pick the wrong path. So this is a really, a, a pretty, totally different type of race. All right, so here's the 340. All right, I had been involved in rivers and helping establish a water trail on the Missouri River. I was cited multiple times in David's uh, book, The Complete Paddler. And I'm pretty sure that's how I got on Scott's radar screen is from that book. Is that, is that accurate? Okay, it doesn't matter. The point is, so Scott Mansker, I don't know him, he calls me up and he says, hey man, I'm thinking of doing this race. I wanna do this race on the Missouri River. I wanna do it from Kansas City down to St. Louis, to St. Charles. And I'm like, well, that's great. Have fun with that, good luck. It's like, I had no personal interest in doing it. Um, and I just wasn't, he, his question he asked me was, how many people you think will sign up and be interested in this? And I didn't even know where to begin because at this time on the Missouri River, when I was out there paddling most of the time, I would run into other paddlers only every once in a while. And when I did, those paddlers invariably were speaking German, French, or they were from New Zealand or Australia. We had a river in Missouri that nobody was recreating on from a paddling standpoint because of a false image that it was dangerous or whatever. But folks in Europe absolutely knew about this river from everything from reading about our Western expansion and Native American interests or just Huckleberry Finn and Mark Twain. But they absolutely understood our rivers more than we do, did. And they were coming here to recreate on a river that had this remarkable historic context. And every one of the paddlers I, I ran into was fully aware of that historical element. But when he talked about this race, it just couldn't get it out of my mind because I was an avid paddler, I was a fitness paddler, and I was paddling on the Missouri River most of the time. So I remember talking to a friend of mine about doing the race, and two weeks before, I just said, okay, that's it, I have to do it. And I told my wife, I gotta do the race. But I also remember doing this. I remember stretching my fingers across the state of Missouri and then on that same map, I was able to go over and stretch my fingers across Lake Michigan. 
and realize that the length of this race is essentially the same thing as if you were to paddle the length of Lake Michigan. And that is how long it is. In fact, it's a little longer than the length of Lake Michigan. So this is truly a, a, a very difficult distance to understand what it means to paddle 340 miles nonstop. You know, most of us will drive across the state of Missouri and we get really ready to get out of the car by the time we, we've made a two hour drive. But when you've done that, you have not driven the entire length of this race. Because if you stretch this thing out, this is quite some distance. All right, so, um, hang on a sec, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. All right, so this is the first year of the race. That bottom right hand picture is the safety boat. That is the safety boat, all right? So that's Scott's boat and that, and you know, to, he stands up in that boat the whole time. So that crazy guy, you were into stand up paddle boarding before it was even big, man, you just didn't know it. And uh, so that was his safety boat. And I think there was 11 paddlers. How many paddlers were in that first? first uh, 11 boats, 15 paddlers. All right, so I remember showing up to this just race. I said, I, I just told my wife I have to do it. And there's just a handful of people standing around. We're talking to each other, but we don't really know each other. And, I, and here's the, the, the safety boat, and that was going to follow us down the river, but it's a huge river. So I didn't expect to see Scott at any time during the race, and I didn't. Um, and here's this guy, West Hansen from Texas, and he's got this carbon fiber super elite boat, and I'm like, have no idea how to even relate to that. There's another guy there who's running some website on race fitness, and so he's uh, Mark Ulez, right? I always mispronounce his last name. And uh, so Mark's from Colorado, and he's got a high-end boat, and he's showing up. And so I'm feeling like a pickup truck at a NASCAR race when it comes to these two guys. But I also remember thinking to myself, they don't know this river. I know this river. Maybe that's an inside advantage. I was in a homemade kayak that, that, uh, that I was on the river all the time with, but hardly a fast boat. You know, it's a touring kayak. And that was that first year. These guys took off like, a, like, like really quickly at the very beginning of the race. But what I want to point out is the guy up in the upper, upper part there. I still don't know what this guy's name was. But this guy showed up in that boat, all right? So this is like a dick Sporting Goods boat, like 10 feet long, two dry bags with straps underneath, which kills your whole speed. Not that he had any whole speed in the boat like that. And this guy finished it, right? Uh, no, he only went five miles. He, 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 well, I, I, I thought he finished it. Okay, I only went five miles. All right, well, I show the Red Bull can. I show the Red Bull can because the race as it's grown over time has these kind of crazy things show up. For example, one year, the race had some people who had a catamaran, like a sailboat, you know, like, you, and they had mounted bass boat seats onto it and torn the sail off of it, and that was the boat they were gonna use. Now, those guys did finish, right? So, the Red Bull one is another one. So, we're in the safety meeting, I think it was the third year, I look over and there's this guy, and he's tapping his leg, and he's got like stacked cans of Red Bull, and he's just pounding it, and I'm thinking, you got to get a good night's sleep tonight because the race starts tomorrow morning and you're not going to sleep well from here until you're done. And he's just pounding these Red Bulls, pounding these Red Bulls. Well, apparently, this guy made it to the about 40 miles down the river before his heart went into tachycardia um, from all the caffeine, and he actually got carted off in an, in, a, in, a, in an ambulance. So every year you see people show up that I'm sure Scott must go, you just have to take a pause, that are wildly unprepared for what they're about to get into. But I've also learned not to write those people off because it is absolutely amazing how many of those people actually finish the journey. All right, so that's what the race looks like now. So you go from 11 boats in the beginning of it to now there's literally a stream of boats as far as you can see when the race starts out. It is a phenomenal feeling to be in that pack doing this race um, I, I, you just have to do it sometime to understand what it feels like to do that. It's a combination of excitement, fear, and, um, and trepidation because it's such a long race that you just don't know what's going to happen, weather, you name it, all sorts of things can come out. All right, but everything's bigger in Texas. This was sent to me by a friend who's now a friend, but that guy who was in the first year racing, West Hansen, sent me this picture. And the reason I put this picture up here is because the Texas boats have dominated the race throughout its history, and they still do to a large degree. 
But they brought a whole nother thing up. Was it the third year that they brought the first multi-man boat up, Scott? So they started bringing up these multi-man boats. These are these long, skinny carbon fiber boats. And this was a very interesting race here because this was a team of um, Texas paddlers, hardcore Texas paddlers, and then was a team of one Texas paddler. And where were the rest of the guys from? From Belize. And they were... This was a battle of attrition um, on who could make it down. And quite a few of the Belize paddlers ended up dropping out before the race was over, but that was quite a battle of wills. And it, they set a record that only just recently got broken. That record that year was stood for quite a while. I'm pretty sure it was that year. All right, so personally, this race transformed what paddling meant for me. And the reason I bring that up is because my story is completely the same as multiple people in the state of Missouri now. So when you would go to the Missouri River park, a parking lot on a boat ramp on the Missouri River, first of all, you wouldn't see another kayak. And then if you did see a kayak, it would just be a touring kayak if there was another kayak. But now when you go to a parking lot, certainly during a race, it is full of high-end race boats. I have gone from paddling touring kayaks to having a whole fleet of super high-end boats that my butt literally hardly fits into because they're so skinny, they're long, they're light, they are ridiculously hard to keep upright, but they're also amazingly fast. So there has been a renaissance of what it means to race in Missouri, but also a renaissance of what it means to race on the river. And as a result of this, there's been a radical change in the type of boats that have occurred, kind of a testing things out. Um, outriggers have become a boat that is highly competitive. In fact, this last year, no doubt about it, we have a local homegrown boy, Ryan Slebos, who built, builds his own solo outriggers and shattered the record on, on, on last year's race. But the open Texas style boats are still seen quite a bit, um, and those boats seem to still be holding their own. But I have a feeling that outriggers and some kind of modification of those are probably the future of the race. To give you an example of these other boats that are there, um, the one on the upper left is a surf ski with a specialized stabilizer in case you lean the boat over too far. The one on the right is actually a paddle boat, so it has a propeller underneath. The person sits back and it's like a recumbent bicycle. Um, people use all sorts of interesting stabilizers to try to deal with the fatigue that happens when you are paddling for nonstop for 50, 40, 50 hours, um, is typically the, the, that would be the average time for most people to finish the race. It's around 50 to 55 hours. Um, the person on the right was in this kind of weird stand-up craft. Um, we, again, we get lots of interesting boats. But this is a boat that was also built by some local paddlers, the Yanceys, and um, they, um, in my opinion, have designed the fastest boat and the most 340 specific boat that is out there. Now, they haven't been paddling last year um, for complex reasons besides just burning out a little bit but there's no doubt that this boat was shattering every race it went in that is an incredibly fast boat and and uh, i think that that's probably the the first missouri 340 specific boat that we've seen come out of here all right the boats themselves are really interesting because when you're in a race that is this long everything decays over time if i have to describe the experience of paddling this race it would be a slow melting of all the things that don't really matter into just the core element of what's left to try to get down the river. Now that's both physically and spiritually. So as you go through the race, you go in fairly fit, you go in fairly hydrated, fairly, fairly well fed, and you go in fairly spiritually ready to go. You're excited. And then over course of time, all of those things decay until you have just this core element. And one of the key pieces of advice I give to anybody on rigging in their boat is to, is to think about what you're gonna be like when you're completely beat down. Because I'm telling you right now, if that suntan lotion is just slightly out of reach, where you have to kind of go through a motion to get to it, you're gonna blow off putting on that suntan lotion and then you're gonna get a sunburn. And then when you get a sunburn, you're gonna stop hydrating correctly. You were, and then you're gonna decay from there. Your chafing will get worse and then you'll be done and you'll, fall, and you'll fall out of the race. So little teeny things add up really fast. And so when you talk about rigging in the boat, really what it's about is making sure everything is right where you can get to it and that your support crew can change things out in a very efficient manner. But there's no doubt 
and I have to be careful my language here because we're being broadcast, but your posterior is probably one of the biggest things you need to think about in this race. Because I'm telling you right now, sitting on, in, a, in a seat where you can't really move and shuffle around like you can in an office chair for 50 hours, you will have a voice talking to you and it's, it's definitely telling you that it's not happy. So there's all kinds of really interesting and bizarre ways of trying to pad up your seat area. And that's a critical area if you're thinking about doing this race is to think about your seat. All right, so there's all sorts of other things which I'm not gonna get into in detail, but I've put this picture up just to kind of show you that this is not a float trip. When you get ready for this race, your boat is being set up and specifically designed to accomplish a task with fluids that can be changed out into receptacles and the whole nine yards. And that is a boat that um, I used in the fastest I've ever done the race. We were the second boat into St. Charles in that, that year um, with Joe Mann, um, but we still, lost to uh, a couple of twins out of Seattle who come down and do this race, and every time they do, they do extremely well. All right, stand-up paddle boarding has become um, more of a thing in this race, and you can't take it away from them. You know, when Shane, who's the guy up there in the upper right, first said he was gonna do this, I was like, yeah, whatever, man, you'll never make it. Not only has he made it, but he's done it multiple times, but he's also not a normal guy. See that down there, that sort of skateboard where he's using a pole? He did that from St. Louis to New Orleans um, on land, right? So he's kind of an odd duck. He's got some twisted things. But I'll tell you what, anytime that guy makes up his mind, he's going to do something. And he's a friend of mine. Anytime he makes up his mind, he's going to do something. Look out. And so he's done this race multiple times. But actually, uh, a guy, Blake, who I was talking to a few days ago, um, I think he set the record on stand-up last year. It was a really fast river last year. A lot of records fell, but it was also had plenty of conditions that would challenge a stand-up paddle border, and so you can't take anything away from it. All right, so another element to do this race that is absolutely critical is your ground crew. And the ground crew is, is way more important than just that they're handing you fluids and nutrition. And I could go into an entire speech about how important it is to stay on top of your fluids and nutrition, but it's also a spiritual uplift. I can tell you that during every race I've ever done, and I've done five of them, um, I have quit the race multiple times during that, that race. And the only reason I get back on the water is because that ground crew is waiting for me at the next boat ramp or I see them at the boat ramp, I'm ready to quit, and I just decide to go one more ramp. And most people I talk to end up in that same cycle. You will end up in these emotional lows during the race. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of this because this is a very, this could be a presentation in and of itself, but there is a whole bunch of technical stuff that you need to also learn in terms of doing uh, the race on the Missouri River. It is a very big, wide open river, so wind is a big factor. It is a channelized system, and I'll go through a few of those things, but there are some unique elements that you're not gonna find in the Texas water safari. It's a huge body of water that you're on. Remarkably big, and I will tell you this much, at night on a full moon, when you're in the middle of that river during this race, you know, that's, that's right up there with any experience you'll have in your entire life. The, the river is majestic, and that's the, the word I always come back to when I describe what it's like to paddle on the Missouri River. It does have barges on it, not as many as it used to, and the barges do kick up waves, but they don't kick up waves that are so intense that, it, that it's gonna disrupt your boat or, or cause you to flip over. Um, the waves are something you'll have to factor into. You'll turn your boat into those waves, but pretty soon things settle down, and I have to dispel the the idea that the barges will create waves so big that they'll flip your boat. The hazard of a barge is they can't steer out of your way. So it's understanding that you have to move out of that barge's way. And where this becomes an, a, a really important factor is two years ago, was the last time I did the race, it fogged in really, really bad on the second night. And on that night, several people who are not locals, who are from out of state, just pushed on through the fog and they told, one of them told me that the way he just felt he could hear what he needed to hear going down the river. Absolutely not. David and I put to shore. Um, we lost, we still came in second in men's tandem, but we lost some, we're, our, our time significantly because there's no way I'm running into something like this, parked or moving down the river in the middle of the night um, in a fog. So there are some unique aspects to this, this race, um, unlike other races. 
The wing dams are these structures that are there to channelize the river. At the right river levels, those can be just barely underwater and can also be a hazard. But a little bit of time on the river, especially with somebody who understands the river, and you'll get very quickly where you understand this. In fact, the bends and how things work are very, very engineered. The river is an engineered river. So one of the things that comes up is where is the flow in the river? And I'm gonna skip through these slides, but I do wanna focus on this one right here. Every single year when someone, when I see teams on this race who are constantly moving from one side of the river to the other as they're chasing what they perceive to be faster water, and especially out-of-state teams tend to do this because on a lot of rivers that aren't as channelized as the Missouri, there are much faster segments of water. And if you can stay in those, especially if you do it consistently over time, it can make a big difference on your total time. This is a Doppler radar. So what this basically shows is the, the movement of the water. The darker the red is the faster the moving the water. And what you can see from this is, remember the, the picture I put up here a little while ago? This is a big river, right? So when you go and look at this Doppler radar, it's pretty obvious that there is a continuous, very wide body of fast moving water. You do not need to spend time getting all over the river trying to find fast water current. If you stay in the middle, when, you, when in doubt, stay in the middle, and if you stay on the outside of the bends, you'll be in the fast water. And there, the subtleties of moving a little bit one way or the other are really, in my opinion, not worth it. So that would be a, a tip I would give anybody who hasn't done the race, or even if you have done the race and you felt like you were chasing fast water, I just would encourage you to stop because that's the science. It's not going to pay out for you. All right, so top 10 tips. Try everything out before the race. This, there's a real tendency the two weeks before the race to get on Amazon.com and start ordering all sorts of cool little things. You know, things that, because you, you're nervous and you start ordering, you know, that cushion for the seat and this, that, and the other thing. You cannot do that. Um, in fact, it always amazes me people who buy a boat a month before the race. The reality is, I think you need to have your entire system down two months before the race. Everything is where it's going to be and you don't change anything, including the shoes you're going to wear, the clothes you're going to wear, the shorts you're going to wear. You know, putting on a brand new pair of cool shorts that you bought from REI might be that those shorts chafe you in the back. And that little bit of chafing is no big deal on a 20 mile float trip, but on a, after a hundred miles of twisting back and forth, that can become a, a tragedy. So everything has to be done beforehand. Chafing is a big deal. Sunscreen is a big deal. A lot of people I see don't, don't get really careful about replying sunscreen. And once you get a really hard burn, you stop, your body loses its ability to thermoregulate. Your posterior is a major consideration. Your hands are a consideration. It doesn't mean you should necessarily wear gloves, but you need to think about it. A lot of times the ways to deal with hands that get really bad is how you grip the paddle. It's a technique issue. Again, we don't have time to it. But number six is probably the most important piece of advice on this whole thing. And that is never ever quit while you're on the water. Never while you're paddling down the river say, I'm, I'm done. I've had it, I'm just gonna quit. Don't even allow yourself to have that, that thought process on the water. The most you can give yourself is at the next ramp, I am so miserable, I'm gonna sit on shore for half an hour and then I'm gonna decide what I'm gonna do. Because I can't tell you how many people I have seen quit on the water, hit the ramp, they, they tell their crew they're done, their crew loads the boats, gets ready to drive out of the parking lot and they go, wait, 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 I think I can keep going. Or they get in the car and drive away and they wish they'd kept going. So never quit on the water. Don't even allow it to enter into your, your, uh, your thought process. Light paddle makes a big difference. Good gear makes a big difference. Though lots of people do this race in a canoe and I would not, an aluminum canoe, and I would definitely not let high-end technical gear keep you from doing the race. You can do this race in a recreational canoe and have a fantastic experience and put up a pretty good time as well. Um, food and hydration, again, we don't have time to get into this, but those are critical. A lot of people drop out of the race because they stop eating or they eat the wrong foods or they don't have foods that they can switch to once their body doesn't want to eat the same thing they thought was going to work. For example, if you start out eating power bars, trust me, after 10 hours, you won't want to see a power bar. And so if the only thing your team has to hand you is power bars for the entire race, 
you have a problem on your hands. So there are all kinds of things to consider in terms of food, but Wes Hansen gave me the, some of the best advice, and that is he said, just be, be able to eat real food periodically during the race. You know, there's nothing like a hamburger or a sub sandwich to um, really kind of pick up your spirits. Hydration is a big deal. Um, we have not had anybody die during the race. Now that's not true. There was a gentleman who went into cardiac arrest, and I don't presume to know exactly the details of what occurred, but I've been told that it was probably a pre-existing condition. The Texas Water Safari has had over the last four or five years a couple of deaths as a direct result of mismanaging hydration. Now, it's a very hot race down there, so you probably would think it was because the person didn't drink enough water and had a heat stroke. But in both cases, the people that died in that race, the, um, the conclusion now is that they overhydrated. And they, it's what's called hypernatremia. And what it does is it throws off your electrolyte balance. So you can drink too much water during an intense physical exercise, and it can, it can be life-threatening, just as life-threatening as not drinking enough water. Um, the rule of thumb is somewhere around a liter an hour. If you're less than that, you should get a little nervous, but you should also get just as nervous if you're drinking more than a liter an hour. And obviously, it depends on the temperature, and it depends on you as an individual. But hydration is probably one of the most important things to get down before the race so that if you're trying to be really competitive. And then bathroom and, and bilge logistics are another one. I'm not gonna get into those here, but you need to at least have a realistic plan. Um, I will tell you this much, I, I went into the race the year that Joe Mann and I did really well, and Joe s started telling me how he had this theory that he was gonna find a way to poop in the boat. I said, no, you're not. He's like, yeah, yeah, man, we'll save us some time. I go, Joe. You're not pooping in the boat. So I don't know how you're going to handle these issues, but you know you do need to think about it. They, they're real, and, 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 and you have to figure it out. Obviously, peeing in the boat is something that you're going to probably do into a bottle, and, 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 and it's more complicated for women than it is for men to accomplish that task. And I've seen some really elaborate ways to approach that, you know, cutouts in the seat. Just like when my wife asked me if she looks fat in this dress, I'm not gonna be stupid enough to get into talking about what I think is strategies for being in a boat for a woman. But the point is, if you, if you, you may wanna contact a racer who's done, done the race and ask her what she did in that regard if you're thinking of doing the race. Um, and, and that's an, an issue that you need to address. All right, so let's go through a little bit about this experience because i've kind of gone through it as if it was like a real kind of clinical like just going out to do a you know a, a 10 mile run or or even doing a, mar a marathon a 25 26 mile run <laughs> this, this race is not normal and and there's nothing normal about what's going to happen to you as you get into this race you are going to hallucinate you are going to see things you are going to go through times when you are just unbelievably happy. You're like, oh my God, my life is awesome. And then you're going to go through times when you're like, why do I hate myself so much? And what is it about, about, about my self-esteem that would cause me to do this to myself? And, and I have a family and I have kids. And what am I, I mean, trust me, you're going to go through the entire emotional gambit during this because this race will kick your butt. All right, it is a unbelievably long distance. Even if you're not trying to be on the podium, it is a huge physical challenge to do the race. And if you're trying to be on the podium, like the last three or four times I've done the race, I've gotten no sleep, none at all. You don't allow yourself any during the entire race. In fact, my daughter used to sit at the end of the, end of the boat ramp with a stopwatch, and the longest we stopped at any ramp was a minute and about 20 seconds. So everything was on the water, on the water, move, move, go, go. And that is going to tear you down over time. See the guy getting his bandage done? That's from having a life jacket that you didn't try out and figure out whether it's gonna chafe you. I put down here on the right, nipples, and it's not, I mean, it is funny, but here's the reason I wanna talk about nipples. This is a guy problem. Guys wear a loose shirt, because that seems like a thing you'd wanna wear in hot temperatures, and that loose shirt does this little shimmy, and you don't notice it. After 100 miles, you're beginning to notice it. After 200 miles, it's the only thing you're noticing, all right? so. I've known, I've seen guys take their shirt off and their nipples were just catastrophic wreck. And they've had to put big patches of duct tape on their, on their chest in order to continue with the race. So those are the little things that are gonna bring you down. It's not very romantic, but that's where it's at. All right, so sleeping. I see people every year, they talk about, yeah, I'm gonna have hammock or tan. My ground crew is gonna set up this place so I can at least get a couple hours sleep. 
you don't, you don't need any of that, man, because that is all you need once you get into that mode. When you are completely unable to paddle and you can't go, this is how you're going to sleep. You are just going to bomb out at wherever you are. I once slept because it was raining so bad and it was storming and I didn't feel it was safe to keep going. And I, all I could do was talk myself into moving eight feet up the ramp and off to the side so nobody would run me over. And literally, there was four inches of water running underneath me as, as it was raining. And I was, it was awesome. I was just, it was fantastic. It was only sucked when I had to get back in the boat. All right, so sleeping is not an issue. That's Merrick, by the way. He's uh, sleeping in a paddling position. Um, all right. You are going to not be fit for public consumption halfway through this race. You are going to spill your pee bottle on yourself multiple times. You are going to, you know, think you were going to burp and you end up throwing up a little bit. I mean, I just can't go through it all. But by the time this thing's done, you, you, you yeah, it's going to take a quarantine zone in order for your family to take you home. Um, you need three or four showers in a row in order to get where you need to be after this thing. It is not a normal event. And the people that come and do this race are not normal either. This is some of my favorite racers. So they've raced multiple, multiple times. And, and one year, this is, uh, this is uh, Black Coffee and um, A-Dog. And one year, they just basically said to each other, this is the way A-Dog told me, he goes, we were like talking, we said, dude, why don't we just make our own boat? They'd already made boats. They'd made wooden kayaks before. He goes, but let's just make it out of stuff that we find in trash cans. That's, let's just, we can't make it out of anything if we can't find it in a trash can. And they both thought it was a great idea. I have no idea how much alcohol was involved in that discussion. But that's what they did. So they went and they built an entire boat out of, out of barrel, plastic barrels. Nothing that they used could be used unless they found it in a, in a dumpster. The paddles were built from a dumpster. I guess he's using a commercial blade up front. But, but A-Dog's using a paddle he built from dumpster diving. And they, this was the boat they used. And they killed it. They did fantastic. These guys come down every single year. This is, uh, this is Los Humongos. This is uh, Wally Werdick and, um, oh my God, I'm forgetting the other guy's name. Remember, do you remember his name? What? Nick, that's right. They come down every year and they're always dressed up like luchadors and they are unbelievably competitive. This was the last time I did the race was with... Uh, was with David Lackey, and we took our boat and painted it like a gigantic lizard, and even put glowing eyeballs in it, and, uh, and you know, got pretty stupid with the whole thing. And you'll see a lot of boats that are decorated like this. This was the support team one year. I, don't, I have no idea what I'm doing wrong in life, that I can't get a Hooters team as my support team, but somebody got a Hooters team as their support team. This was like the second year, all right? I have no idea the backstory. Do you know the backstory on that at all? It's not worth it? All right, well, anyway, I have this one I, I can't explain to you. I have no idea. There are, I don't know if that's a California or North Carolina or something, but that's not a Missouri plate. And I'm not sure what the shopping cart's all about. That was our shop. It is, okay. All right, well, it's probably brilliant in a really redneck kind of way. All right, so this guy... He was fast, man. He did really well in the race. In fact, his partner dropped out about halfway through the race, and he just kept paddling a, a, a tandem canoe by himself. Finished the race, still did it in pretty good time. He's from Texas. And then he just stripped down to his underwear and walked around with a guitar for like a day and a half. I mean, he wouldn't even talk. You'd like go, hey, what's up, man? He'd just give you that, that grin right there. He wouldn't even say anything to you and just walk around in his underwear. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I don't. I don't pretend that there. You could have an entire slideshow just on 340 tattoos, no doubt about it. In fact, Scott's probably had most of them texted to him. 79 hours is not a very fast time. So that's kind of like your girlfriend, you know, where you have the you have to scratch Susie off because it's no longer Susie. So I, yeah, I, I think if I was to put the tattoo on, I would leave the time off because hopefully they'll improve that. I have I can't explain this one at all. All right, but that's a support team right there. So that's actually for for Matt uh, Green, and those of you who know Matt Green will know that his friends, including me, are are not probably the healthiest individuals around. All right, this is an amazing story, and I'm almost done here. 
This is Adog again, the one who built the canoe uh, out of plastic barrels. I, I think in some ways, I, this is the story that I have more respect about the 340, and, and almost in some ways it's what the 340 is all about, is what these guys did. They paddled down the, ra the race with their bikes broke down and on the back deck. And then when they got to St. Charles, they unfolded a trailer that they had inside the boat, and they put the bikes back together, and they rode all the way back to Kansas City. Yeah, that's awesome. And so we've had some very elite racers, you know, some, some national level racers. Some of the top ultra marathon paddlers in the United States have come to this race and have put up unbelievable times. We've had some, you know, just shattering times. The interesting thing is, Missouri paddlers are starting to put up very competitive times, and now some of the records belong in Missouri paddlers' hands. But in general, we've had some world-class talent show up who have really just hit the bell on this thing. But I know from talking to Scott about this more than once that this is the kind of thing that is the heart and soul of the 340. It's not, not taking anything away from the, the first place winners, but it's that, it's that person who's doing this is a personal challenge that is the heart and soul of this. And Scott has intentionally tried to keep it that way, and, and I think he's right on track. Because this race has done, oh, hang on, has done more to bring attention to the Missouri River than any other element that could have occurred. In terms of river cleanups, in terms of water trails, all those things were helpful. They were helping people understand the river, get out there. But this race has completely completely thrown the door open. And now, whenever you go out on the weekend and you go out on the river, you will see a handful of kayakers every single time all over the place. And they're not all 340 race racers. People see in an article in the newspaper, they see that people are paddling on the river, they see this race, they may not ever want to do the race, but they, they begin to have an interest in getting out there themselves for the first time. So, I, I definitely think that Scott deserves a lot of credit for this, and I think this race has been kind of unique in what it's positioned us for. But I was going to show this because when you start looking for all these crazy races, I was trying to show a few, I came across this. The Canadians beat us when it comes to crazy. This is a race across a major, major wide river, and I don't remember what town it is. But what they do is as soon as they begin to get some leads, which is the open water show up, they have this race and they build these boats specifically for this race. And the whole idea is that they run the boat because they can run across the ice, but then they can jump in and if they have to, they'll pick up paddles, but they almost never use them. And they actually race across this ice. Can you imagine how dangerous that is? You lose contact with that boat and fall into that, into that water, you're not coming back up. But anyway, that's a pretty crazy race as it is. So I'm, I'm done. And I, and I just want to kind of put in perspective that this is our race. So even if you never want to do this race, we now have in the state of Missouri the equivalent, in my opinion, of like having the Tour de France. We have the longest continuous canoe and kayak race in the United States. And it's right here in our backyard. And the number of people who come from out of state and all the hotels that they get and all of the ground crews and all the gas stations and the food that they buy, the economic impact of this race is phenomenal. And it still is frustrating to me that the state as a whole has not woke up to what we have. But I guess it'll happen. We went through our 10th anniversary on the race last year and it's now a fixed asset. This is a tradition in the state of Missouri and your grandkids will be doing this race at some point in time. Um, and, uh, and that's when Scott and I will be telling stories about how hard it was back when the river was longer, right? Okay, that's it, thanks. <laughs>